Yes, it's working. So if x is a number greater than 1, just an example, which of these two will be bigger? 1 over x. Of course. Of course. Because the higher the denominator, the smaller the fraction. Exactly. So this is another kind of a, you know, um, example like this one. We need to, moving forward, we need to remember that if x is anywhere between negative 1 and 1, the function x squared would be between 0 and 1. And that's another example of how functions work. So if I increase the denominator, I decrease the function, 1 over x. We may encounter other general truth moving forward. OK, uh, any questions? Any questions, anyone? Uh, can you do another example of a problem like that? Yes. So let me go back. OK, so um, I let you choose, actually. I don't know which one else, which other one. So I chose the one that was in red. Um, fifty-four. Well, fifty-four. Oh no, I'm reading it wrong. Um, the the one after the red one. You mean this one, fifty-eight? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very good. Let's do that. Perfect pick. I'm sure. And I think as I said, I said I'm nine. Okay. So we have the square of two pi over. So again, it's show. Don't do not calculate anything. Actually, for this one, we can calculate, but we are not asked to calculate. But this one, we can, I can determine the antiderivative. It's negative sine x. I plug in the numbers, and I get the answer. But that's not what they want us to do. OK, let me put the book aside. It's Does that just, just say cosine x or cosine cubed x? No, cosine. OK, sorry. I, I want, yeah, sorry about that, my handwriting. Um, it's uh, just cosine. We would not be able to determine the antiderivative of cosine cubed. Not that, not in this class and not that fast, anyway. So, I start again with what I know, and this is what I know. That's my starting point. I know that um, x is anywhere between 30 degrees and 45 degrees, but I have to use radians. Okay. Did I build the function? No, I didn't. I need to apply cosine to all this. Cosine pi over 6, cosine x, cosine pi over 4. Do not copy the inequality symbol, please. Because I have to look at this function. On the previous situation, it's very clear between negative when x is between negative 1 and 1, x squared will be between 0 and 1. Not between 1 and 0, lower 1, upper, uh, lower uh, 0, upper 1. Now let's see here. If you remember how to graph cosine, so I'm just going to graph the first quadrant. So this is 0. A pi over 2, maybe let's go even go to pi. So pi over 2 and pi. And this is 1. And this is negative 1. So at 0, the function cosine is 1, but it's 0 at pi over 2, and it becomes negative 1 at pi. 1, negative 1, and this is cosine x, which means that if this is pi over 6 
and this is pi over 4 in the middle. Look what happens. Which one is bigger? I cannot blindly copy the inequality symbols. I have to check whether the function is increasing or decreasing on that interval. So which one is bigger? Is it cosine pi over 6 or is it cosine pi over 4 that is bigger? Six. Right. So be very careful with these inequalities because they may be this way, but they may be this way. So for decreasing functions, it's a different story. So the values of x increase, but at the same time, the values of cosine decrease. So now I will write it correctly. I know that cosine pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2, which is less than cosine x, which is less than cosine pi over 6, which is the square root of 3 over 2. Did I build the function inside? Yes, I'm happy. I don't have to do anything else. I don't need any other stunts. I only had cosine, and cosine is all I needed. I have that property that says this. That's all I need. Then the integrals will be in the same order. Of course, between pi over 6 and pi over 4. And it's done. But let's finish it up. So the middle doesn't change. Let's determine the left and the right. The square root of 2 has to stay, which function prime is 1, because I took the constant in front, so it has to be x, which will be pi over 4 minus pi over 6. Something at this end, the square root of 3 over 2, the same thing, pi over 4 minus pi over 6, because it will be x. And yes, I have to perform these calculations. And I better get the square of 2 pi over 24 and the square of 3 pi over 24. Otherwise, we have to go back. OK, so uh, the square of 2 over 2 and the least common denominator is 12. Uh, this one needs a 3 and this one needs a 2. So the top is pi. So yes, the square of 2 pi over 24, it's that. Now let's see on this side, at this end. Uh, the square of 3 over 2, again, the same thing, pi over 12. So the square of 3 pi over 24. And we showed, without calculating anything, that indeed the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 4 from cosine x is between these two numbers. And that's what we were asked to show. Good pick. Interesting problem. Careful with the, uh, you cannot automatically say, OK, this is the order of um, x. The order of the function will be the same, because it's not always the case. OK. Uh, now, I think we are ready, unless you want to work on anything else. I think we are ready to move on to uh, 5.3. The fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of calculus. You can say again, uh, no. We need to look at the other the other part. So, part one and part two. For part two, I'm just going to write the result. We used it so many times already. The integral from a to b from f of x dx. F of x must be continuous on a comma b is 
the antiderivative, the most general antiderivative from A to B, which translates into uppercase of B minus uppercase of A. That is done. I didn't, I could not wait. Like I couldn't wait with L'Hopital's rule for the end of chapter four. I needed it in chapter three. The same thing here. I needed this way before it's presented in 5.3. Okay. But what about part one? So in short, what does part two say? It teaches us how to evaluate a definite integral. That's all it says. Under this condition of continuity, it says that if you want to find the integral from a to b from f of x dx, find its antiderivative. If you don't, if you cannot find the antiderivative, then you cannot use this. So assuming and hoping that we can find the antiderivative, then I know the answer right away. Well, what does part one say? Part one is showing us that integration and differentiation are inverse operations, inverses of each other. Better, I would have, I would have, I should have written an inverse operation. That's better. But you know what I mean. So that's part one. How does this show? Okay. So part one of the FTC fundamental theorem of calculus. FTC. It has two parts. One shows how to calculate definite integrals. The other one is showing us that uh, differentiation and integration are inverse operations. Okay. So let's take a look at the following scenario. Here's a function. T f of t. And you can say use x. No. Now this time I have to use a different letter. Okay, I hope you agree that um, on the interval a comma b, the function is continuous. And if I ask you what is the integral from a to b from f of x dx, aha, no, 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 t. You will tell me what? You don't know what it is, but you know what it represents. Is the area. Okay. Now, here's our next step. I'm going to say that there is x. Then is there is a number anywhere between a and b. So in other words, I'm telling you that x could be a, or x could be here, or could be here, or could be here, could be here, could be here, anywhere. And now I'm going to ask you, um, what do you think this represents? And let me give you a hint, and you will answer that if x is here, then this is the area. If x is here, then this is this area. If x is here, then this would be this area. And so on and so forth. So how many different possibilities I have here? Exactly the, the number of possibilities for x I have the number of possibilities for this. How many? Infinite. If x starts here and ends here, for any x between these two, I will have a different number. So what do you think this is? Again, let me give you one more hint. For an x, I get a y. For x2, I get y2. For x3, I get y3, and so on and so forth. What am I creating here? 
Okay, I'm going to call this input. I'm going to call this output. So, what is this? If for every input I get a different output, what am I creating? A function. Really. Thank you very much. And it is a function of x in the form of an integral. g of x is a function of x given in the form of an integral. So what? It's the area. I can create any function I want. As long as for every input I get a different output and and um, I don't get for x1, I don't get two outputs, that is a function. But if I get for x1 two different outputs, which is not the case, then it's not a function, but this is definitely a function. Because for every x, I will get a different y value. OK. Fine. We created a function that looks like an integral. So what? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to, in, to, in, uh, to differentiate both sides now. So this is a function given as an integral. And I want to apply differentiation to an integral and see what happens. OK. I'm not going to go back there. I'm just going to copy it one more time. And I want to differentiate a function that is given in the form of an integral. I have a function as an integral, and I want to apply differentiation to it. Because I know that when I integrate a, a, a derivative, I get the function. Now I want to show that when I differentiate an integral, I also get the function back. Otherwise, it will not work. So g prime of x, when I differentiate the integral, the integral disappears, the dt disappears with it, and I get f of x. This is only showing that when I differentiate an integral, I get the function. Of course, with this in it, Okay. So after you differentiate f t dt, that would be that would then go to f of x. I'm differentiating not f t dt. I'm into I'm differentiating the integral from f of t dt. Okay, and so since you have x as the upper bound, then it will go back into the equation. Correct. Exactly. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. So now let's look at applications of this. So we will be given a bunch of functions. Whenever I'm given a function in a form of an integral, like this one, I will never be uh, uh, asked to, dif to find the integral. No, no, no. I will only be asked to differentiate both sides and find g prime. This is the only question that I could be asked here. If I'm given a function in a form of an integral, the only thing I could be asked to do is to find the difference.